I am uh, happy and sad to be here. I'm happy because it's a happy occasion, but it's, it's also bittersweet, even though I know immediately we have to say Hannah's not leaving, she's not going, and um, we even have a meeting that we're, uh, that's scheduled, um, so that helps with my, uh, my separation anxiety. Um, but uh, I'm very, very happy um, to be chairing this panel. Um, just a word of thanks before we start. I want to thank, in addition to everyone who has already been thanked, uh, to thank Yuval Blumenthal for his uh, work in uh, organizing and orchestrating this day. Um, I want to say that um, Hannah uh, has been very, very important in my own um, academic life. Um, very often during the dissertation and also after the dissertation, I was hearing different voices or different people. And the person that I always knew I could come to for you know, solid advice, who would see beyond the fluctuations of, of the differences was, was Hannah. And um, her advice has been tremendous always, um, very helpful, very generous. Um, and so that's why it's bittersweet, I say, but um, but thank you, Hannah. I want to thank you in, in, in public in addition to thanking you in private. Um, we're going to start with um, Gaia Traub uh, Sapojnik, who is a former student of Hannah and of the department. And she's going to read uh, Virginia Woolf for us. Thank you. Um, may I just say before I start read, um, that Hannah's classes were definitely one of my favorites and um, always a great pleasure. And every text that I learned with you is um, always stayed with me. And your ability to, to make everything so clear, I was always amazed by that. <laughs> so thank you very much. For having lived in Westminster, how many years now? Over 20. One feels, even in the midst of the traffic, or waking at night, Clarissa was positive, a particular hush or solemnity, an indescribable pause, a suspense, but that might be her heart affected, they said, by influenza, before Big Ben strikes. There, out it boomed. First a warning, musical, then the hour, irrevocable. The leaden circles dissolve in the air. Such fools we are, she thought, crossing Victoria Street. For heaven only knows why one loves it so, how one sees it so, making it up, building it round one, tumbling it, creating it every moment afresh. But the veriest frumps, the most dejected of miseries, sitting on doorsteps, drink the downfall, do the same, can't be dealt with, she, was, she felt positive by acts of parliament for that very reason. They love life. In people's eyes, in the swing, tramp, and trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwichmen shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs, in the triumph and the jingle, and the strange high singing of some airplane overhead, was what she loved. Life, London, this moment of June. But how strange, on entering the park, the silence, the mist, the hum, the slow swimming happy ducks, the pouched birds waddling, and who should be coming along with his back against the government buildings, most appropriately carrying a dispatch box stamped with the royal arms, who but Hugh Whitebread, her old friend Hugh, the admirable Hugh. Good morning to you, Clarissa, said Hugh, rather extravagantly, for they had known each other as children. Where are you off to? I love walking in London, said Mrs. Dalloway. Really, it's better than walking in the country. They had just come up, unfortunately, to see doctors. Other people came to see pictures, go to the opera, take their daughters out. The Whitebreads came to see doctors. 
Bond Street fascinated her. Bond Street early in the morning in the season, its flags flying, its shops, no splash, no glitter, one roll of tweed in the shop where her father had bought his suits for 50 years, a few pearls, salmon on an ice block. That is all, she said, looking at the fishmongers. That is all, she repeated, pausing for a moment at the window of a glove shop where before the war you could buy almost perfect gloves. And her old uncle William used to say, a lady is known by her shoes and her gloves. He had turned on his bed one morning in the middle of the war. He had said, I've had enough. Gloves and shoes. She had a passion for gloves. But her own daughter, her Elizabeth, cared not a straw for either of them. There were flowers, delphiniums, sweet peas, bunches of lilac, and carnations, masses of carnations. There were roses, there were irises. Oh, yes. So she breathed in the earthy garden sweet smell as she stood talking to Miss Pym, who owed her help and thought her kind. For kind she had been years ago, very kind, but she looked older this year. Turning her head from side to side among the irises and roses, and nodding tufts of lilac with her eyes half closed, snuffing in after the street uproar, the delicious scent, the exquisite coolness, and then opening her eyes. How fresh, like frilled linen, clean from a laundry laid in wicker trays, the roses looked, and dark and prim the red carnations, holding their heads up, and all the sweet peas spreading in their bowls, tinged violet, snow white, pale, as if it were the evening and girls in muslin frocks came out to pick sweet peas and roses after the superb summer's day, with its almost blue-black sky, its delphiniums, its carnations, its arum lilies, was over. And it was the moment between six and seven when every flower, roses, carnations, irises, lilac, glows white, violet, red, deep orange, every flower seems to burn by itself softly, purely in the misty beds. And how she loved the great white moth spinning in and out over the cherry pie, over the evening primroses. Everything had come to a standstill. The throb of the motor engine sounded like a pulse irregularly drumming through an entire body. And the sun became extraordinarily hot because the motor car had stopped outside Mulberry's shop window. Old ladies on the tops of omnibuses spread their black parasols. Here a green, here a red parasol, opened with a little pop. Mrs. Dalloway, coming to the window with her arms full of sweet peas, looked out with her little pink face pursed in inquiry. Everyone looked at the motor car. Septimus looked. Boys on bicycles sprang off. Traffic accumulated. And there the motor car stood with drawn blinds and upon them a curious pattern like, like a tree, Septimus thought. And this gradual drawing together of everything to one center before his eyes, as if some horror had come almost to the surface and was about to burst into flames, terrified him. The world wavered and quivered and threatened to burst into flames. It is I who am blocking the way, he thought. Was he not being looked at and pointed at? Was he not waited there, rooted to the pavement for a purpose? But for what purpose? But other people got between them in the street, obstructing him, blotting her out. He pursued. She changed. There were color in her cheeks, mockery in her eyes. He was an adventurer. Reckless, he thought, swift, daring. Indeed, landed as he was last night from India, a romantic buccaneer, careless of all these damned proprieties, yellow dressing gowns, pipes, fishing rods in the shop windows, and respectability and evening parties and spruce old men wearing white slips beneath their waistcoats. He was a buccaneer. 
On and on she went, across Piccadilly and up Regent Street ahead of him. Her cloak, her gloves, her shoulders combining with the fringes and the laces of the feather boas in the windows to make the spirit of finery and whimsy which dwindled out of the shops onto the pavement as the light of a lamp goes wavering at night over hedges in the darkness. Laughing and delightful, she, was, she had crossed Oxford Street and Great Portland Street and turned down one of the little streets. And now, and now the great moment was approaching. For now, she slackened, opened her bag, and with one look in his direction, but not at him, one look that bade farewell, summed up the whole situation and dismissed it triumphantly forever, had fitted her key opened the door and gone. Clarissa's voice saying, remember my party, remember my party, sang in his ears. The house was one of those flat red houses with hanging flower baskets of vague impropriety. It was over. Thank you.